This is Wow! What, what a week. What a week. Politics. Politics. Hello, hi, wowzers. Another week in SA, and another thing we thought we wouldn't see. A radical black politician holding hands with a somewhat radical white politician. Here to hold our hands through the past week's happenings. Make some noise for Butsang Mudimuame Muilwa. Wow, uh, morning fresh. What a week. Morning to the viewers. Yes, sir. Oh, what a week indeed. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, how are you, my brother? One of the big uh, stories of the last three weeks has to be the Tabo uh, Besta story. How is that even part of political discourse? Well, I, I, I think it becomes part of the political discourse or engagements, not because of Tabo Besta escape, because yes. of the criminal activity, sure. but of how it happened, where it happened. Okay. It happened, number one, in the one of the two uh, private uh, public partnership prisons in South Africa. Mm. Uh, the one in Mangaun, there's one in Venda. Sure. And, uh, and also, that is supposed to be a maximum security prison that is uh, uh, owned and managed by you know, a consortium of foreign companies, mm. the G4S uh, consortium from the USA, uh, UK, as well as Australia. Mm. There are a few South Africans who are involved. I've, I've done actually an investigation into those prisons uh, last year, February, and it was just for my own studies. Sure, sure. And why do we have two private prisons that I'm telling people, and people who were actually even arguing with me to say that's not true, and I provided the figures, mm. that those two prisons, they are costing us more than 50% of the actual budget, personnel budget of the Department of Correctional Services. So correctional services involved in those prisons as well. Most of their budget for personnel purposes, it goes towards those prisons. And we have this job of best there escaping from that prison. And I don't call it escaping, you know, it's a walk out of that prison. Sure. But it becomes a political discourse because if you look at it, there's no way that Tabo Bester will have not walked out of that prison without political interference, without heavyweights in politics. There's very senior people in government mm. who are involved into that whole process. We may not know who at this stage, but I'm saying it is not possible mm. that a person would have had such a daring escape from prison. But also, what brought the highlight was the Department of Correctional Services, or now it's under, you know, Correctional Services under justice, keeping quiet for more than a year about the findings of the cops that was found or, you know, uh, assuming that it's Tabo Besta. Why were they covering it? Why were they quiet about it? Why did they even refuse to give uh, uh, the investigators or, or the media investigators information regarding the autopsy that was conducted on that person? Mm. These investigators or media people had to go to court papers, actually, to find that autopsy. Then correctional services started talking after. But again, fresh and the viewers, I'm, I'm concerned about the level about this type of best there politically. Uh, I think we should start asking question, who was this guy before he went to prison? Mm. How much hold does he have on politicians? Why is it so important that he had so much money? He ran an international medical seminar from a prison cell, dressed in suits like a true executive. So you can see the power he has over politicians, over public administrators, and correctional services or justice, even law enforcement like police services. Mm. If it wasn't of somebody who knew the lady doctor friend, girlfriend in inverted commas or customary law wife and took their photos or, you know, blew a whistle on them by seeing them at some Woolies or Woolworth store mm. in Santid, where would we be as a country? You know, it's so sad that yesterday, actually two days ago, the real Tabo Bester came out. This is again where government comes in. The real Tabo Bester, a person who lost his identity. His whole life has been wiped off, has come out to say, I, I couldn't apply for passport, ID, social grant, or anything else because somebody was using my name. So the person who went to jail, mm -hmm. who is that person? Sure. And that's why it's of, of political interest to say, we have put a person in jail who was on social media and, and for serious crimes, murder and rape. We are the world capital of rape. We are one of the leading countries in violence and, 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 you know, and murder. And now this person has played politician, business people. He has run a forex from jail. He's run a medical seminar attended by the Usu of South Africa. 
I'm not taking this guy very light, and I think the government must start being honest and serious with the citizens of this country because we've got somebody who's very dangerous to the society. It's loose on the street, mm. and 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 the government must take this matter serious. And I mean, again, fresh point the correctional services comes and say to the nation, please help us find this person. While for months they were denying to give us information that could have aided them to find that person before they deny us. The question is, why are they denying? Why is Bester protected? Who is Chabo Bester? We know that the corpse that was found in the same was not Chabo Bester. Mm -hmm. We now know that there's a human being, the real Chabo Bester, but we do not know who is this fugitive. And obviously then it means we have a prisoner that is unaccounted for. Uh, absolutely. Well, the, the unaccounted prisoner is twofold, and this is my view. Mm -hmm. and, and the second part, I, I, I want to believe that one more, and I want to say to our, our followers and viewers, if that person who was found in the cell was one of the prisoners, that would have went out very quickly mm -hmm. because other prisoners would have made noise to say, Mr. So-and-so is missing, missing amongst yes. us. So based on that assumption that I'm having, I think the corpse that was found there, it was brought into the cell. I don't think that person was a prisoner because the other prisoners would have been asking questions again. Oh, oh, authorities that came in that morning and days after who were counting prisoners, they would have long picked up that one other prisoner mm -hmm. uh, is missing. So I think that corpse was brought into that cell uh, from somewhere else. I think it's maybe one of those people who were stolen from government mortuaries, uh, uh, who were supposed to have proper spin and unclaimed family members, people on, you know, road accidents and things mm -hmm. like that. I, I strongly believe that that cops was brought into the cell. Let's move to Pretoria. The city of Tswane has a new executive mayor for now. So, you know, the DA and co have won again. I do. So, yes. Mayor Brink is back. So, well, so let's talk about the madness that is, you know, current uh, coalition politics. Look, again, I'll always say to, to, the, to the viewers, it's said that I'm a resident of Tswan, you know, and, and this circus is happening under my municipality. One, I can, I can tell your views, viewers that this administration, it's not even going to last for three months. Mm -hmm. It will not. We have already said yesterday that the mayor is already not comfortable with the speaker. They are, they are trying to push the speaker out because they felt betrayed as the DA and its coalition. Mm -hmm. They felt betrayed by COPE and other parties that move with EFF and the ANC. So the speaker already is not in good terms with, with the mayor, and the mayor doesn't want this speaker. So they're going to try and push this speaker out, which will actually collapse the council. But there's something, if you look at the figures, that, that seriously happened there. There are people, four or five people, from either the ANC or the EFF or their coalition partners, COPE, who actually voted with, 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 with this speaker. The, the, the Council of Tswane has approximately 112, 113, I mean 212, 213 councillors. One was absent officially, so if they are left with 112, they needed 107 a vote to be there, 109. But their numbers combined, the parties that are in coalition with COPE, mm. combined their numbers is 105, and they had 109 votes. So four people from the opposition of the coalition of EFF, ANC, COPE, and the others. Four people that side voted with the DA to come into power. And I can tell you that may have been caused by the instability inside COPE. Oh, yes. And as I said, COPE, COPE was, a, was a key role player and key maker in this whole process. But the infighting of COPE between the president, Musiwa Lekota, and, and the Willy Madisa faction, it may have led to what is happening in Tswani. And unfortunately, Tswani is going to be unstable again. In, in fact, wasn't there a call uh, literally now that uh, Musiwa Lekota must step down as president of COPE? Well, there's been that call for quite a number of years, but it, it, it gained momentum this week because of the letters and the false signatures. Remember, there were letters going back and forth mm. between Musi and the Function and others to say, I didn't do those letters, my signature was forged. But I think COPE must start taking its members and people very seriously. They are playing Mickey Mouse and kindergarten games. You know, imagine a whole respectable person like Ntate Lekota. Maybe it's time for Ntate Lekota to retire from politics. He has been in politics yesterday, yeah, you know, from the UDF in the 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. from, he, he must just let the young ones come because they are actually messing up COPE. That is already not coping with the political situation in the country. If they are struggling at 
a municipality mm -hmm. find find is the biggest metro in africa they are struggling to get the housing order at, a, at an important metro what about in regional politics or provincial politics what about in national politics and and again this exposes the danger of coalitions mm -hmm. this exposes how if this country goes into coalition why we might find ourselves you know in the near future so Mr. Lekota must go eat his hat in peace. And he never he never ate his hat in peace, but I think the gentleman you know, I, I think we must start telling our elders to retire. Yes. It, it, there's nothing wrong in retiring. We're, we're grateful for all that you've done. They've done well. And yes. and, and, and especially people like Ntatelekota. Ntatelekota is a black consciousness, you know, a product. He, he was one of the people who formed the UDF, which was the front of the ANC in the 80s. He became a minister of, of, of uh, uh, what do you call it, of defense in the country. He went on and he formed COPE. So he must not destroy that legacy mm -hmm. that he has created. And But, you know, politicians, the more you tell them to retire, is the more they say I'm fit and the people still want me. I don't know which people. There are 10 people that they are following him, and that's where the challenge is. Let's move to BRICS. So BRICS member states have finally responded to the ICC saying, listen, uh, Putin is a fugitive now. He must be arrested by any means necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Well, look, I, I think I'm very impressed by the BRICS member states, starting with China, you know, mm. the biggest member. Uh, 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 Xi Jinping did the right thing, actually. When Putin was supposed to visit uh, 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 China, on a bilateral agreement, the president of China, I think it was a very good military strategy, but also not to rattle the NATO forces. Or he said, no, no, don't come to China. Mm -hmm. I will come to Russia, to, to Russia and we'll engage on this. For, for military safety, I think that was the right move. But President uh, Putin is scheduled to visit South Africa on a very important BRICS summit, uh, you know, come, come August. And I don't know why people are already shaking now uh, when August is a little bit far, a lot can happen in politics and in a military war between now and August. Mm -hmm. But I think the response of BRICS member states, particularly India and Brazil, in standing up and saying to the ICC, uh, uh, we are not getting ourselves involved into that warrant of arrest, and we are not going to implement that. And the call to South Africa, to South Africa, can you respond, can you take a stand? There's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. in South Africa. But I've, I've spoken to somebody very reliable from international relations, and I said, what is the country's position? Uh, my, my view in this instance is that South Africa doesn't have to go and, and reinvent the wheel mm. and look at the bill on how to protect President Putin. We shouldn't change our laws for an individual. I, I, I respect and I like President Putin a lot, but once a country starts considering making special laws mm -hmm. or special recognition for a certain individual, then we are on the wrong foot. We should apply what we already have. South Africa has a constitution. We have our domestic rules, which supersede the international regulations. So our domestic rules uh, cannot, uh, ICC decision, even if we are a member, mm -hmm. cannot be above our domestic regulations. So what of, for instance, the Vienna Conventions? What do those say of sitting presidents and arrests? The, the, the Vienna Convention is, is, is actually not talking specifically or only about the Vienna Convention. It does mention that about, about the, the sitting president or head of state. Mm. And, and even some, you know, prime, prime people like, you know, uh, 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 the Pope, for example, enjoys the benefits of the Vienna Convention. But this is where it comes in. Mm. The Vienna Convention on, you know, protocols and, and diplomatic relations, it's very specific on people who are traveling and carrying what we call full diplomatic passport. Okay. You've got an official passport. Yeah. You've got passports that are diplomatic by the issued to consuls and, you know, uh, consul generals and so forth. But when, once you have a full diplomatic passport, like, like you know, the excellencies as ambassadors, uh, you know, heads of states, they are enjoying full diplomatic immunity. We don't have to scratch our head. We can receive President Putin in South Africa under the Vienna Convention because clearly he will be traveling from Moscow mm. to Tswane carrying a full diplomatic passport. So we must just invoke in the Vienna Convention and say, no, 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 we are not going to arrest. We know that we are co-signatories of both conventions, the mm -hmm. ICC as well as the Vienna Convention. So we must use one against the other one and say, but we cannot arrest President Putin because he is traveling on a full diplomatic passport. Sure. That actually allocates him immunity 
to matters like being arrested and prosecuted and so forth, you understand? So I think the country should not stress too much about that. You must just tell the ICC that, no, no, he's a sitting head of state. Mm. He's traveling with a diplomatic passport. Therefore, he, he, he is enjoying diplomatic privileges and immunities. And that's it. But didn't Minister Pando also say that Putin is welcome here? I, I actually was very impressed and very happy with the, you know, very direct, straightforward mm. words of Minister Pando. Although it was not an official statement, but yes, yes he was he was being interviewed by the media mm. as the Minister of International Relations and said, but we don't have issues. President Putin is our friend, is a he is not wanted in South Africa, and, and he is welcome to come to South Africa to do his job as a head of state and a member of BRICS. Mm. For us, for me, that was a very bold statement from Minister Pando. I just hope he's going to receive support from his principal president, Ramaphosa, as well as the ruling party mm. that has deployed Minister Pan. But we have seen the ANC, the Communist Party, and the whole alliance have said uh, they are going to rally behind President Putin coming to South Africa. And I think South Africa is at a common ground besides, obviously, the democratic alliance mm. uh, towards uh, our friendship and relation with President Putin or with the Republic of Russia in this instance. Let's move from the east to the west. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris is doing a song and a dance and a donation and whatever else you want to call it in West Africa. Let's talk about that. Well, again, uh, you know, in our last conversation, we spoke about how America is going to start talking to people who were seen in the past or countries as the not so good allies. One of them is Ghana. Sure. Understand? And, and, and there goes the vice president, a very powerful envoy, not just a minister of international relations, which is called in the USA, the minister of international relations is actually a secretary of state. Yes. They, they are saying the vice president, you know, that there's a second citizen of the U.S. to go into four African states, a West African state, and he is she's actually carrying a plane full of dollars, you know, dishing dollars out to his African leaders. That is very concerning. While we have been talking about how African states, Namibia, Botswana, uh, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and, and, and uh, uh, Uganda, in the last few weeks, they've stood up and, and, and said to the French and the Americans, enough is enough, you are not going to detain terms to us. Mm. We have heard President Museveni saying to the Americans, you can keep your donor money, they are actually giving us problems. Boom, there goes Ghana, the first you know, uh, African country to gain independence from colonialists. Right. And they accept these billions of dollars from you know the, the U.S. Vice President. And what are they doing? They are actually asserting themselves in that region to try and make sure that China and Russia are not overtaking them like they've done in other African states by creating the relations with those countries. So it is the battle and the scrabbling for Africa again. Mm. It's back in a different format. In the past, it was for colonialism. That came near colonialism. But America is coming as imperialists. And, other, and imperialism doesn't only come from the West. Sure. It can easily come from the East. So there's a battle and a struggle for Africa at the moment, and they're being teaching dollars. But you know what? Economists will tell you anybody who's going to be keeping dollars uh, is doomed because very soon, with BRICS growing its its members and China proposing the trade, as Gaddafi had done, he said, let's do it with gold. Mm -hmm. Russia says, let's do it with oil. And let's trade with each other. That dollar is going to be just a paper. So what the U.S. area has done, they've printed dollars mm. and they're busy teaching them to African states. In fact, China and Brazil um, reached a deal that they're going to start trading in their own currencies. Yes. That uh, why aren't we dealing in the yen and the real? Ch China and Brazil, China and Russia yes. as well. Mm. Look, the, the yen is, is, is much more powerful, much, much, much more available mm. when you look at it, but only due to the number. China, China is a giant in this whole thing. Mm. It will be easier for both of them to deal with the yen, and Russia has accepted it. Remember, remember now, Russia can't trade internationally due to the sanctions. Yes. But, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a move in the right direction. What we should guard against as BRICS member state that China must not become the new USA. Oh, yes. China must not come and suddenly everybody wants to have yens in their pockets. We should avoid doing that. The method that uh, Colonel Gaddafi had proposed to say let countries deal with commodities that they have most, I think that's the best model. Mm -hmm. If South Africa wants to, to, to trade with platinum and gold and so forth, unfortunately, we don't own those things. They are owned by imperialist these mines. But let those, let those be the commodities we trade in. Russia came with a proposal. I have oil. I'll give my friends and my neighbors or whoever that needs my oil, I'll give them oil. And I think we should go that direction and get rid of this dollar-dominated 
you know, market. And in that manner, uh, BRICS will be able to, 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 to overpower the former West. Again, what is important is the interest that has been shown by the Middle East, the Arab countries, the OPEC members towards joining BRICS. At the moment, I can tell you and the viewers that over 20 countries have already submitted formal applications to join BRICS. I don't know what we will call it at the time. Uh, 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 you can call it a new world order. Yeah, of well, the name doesn't matter for me because the BRICS comes from an abbreviation. But over 20 countries have submitted their applications. Mm -hmm. Almost five of them, they're very close to get approval during the summit in South Africa in August. So Prince may, we may wake up in August and Prince may have 10 to 12 member states. And these are powerful countries, Venezuela, you know, the Saudi Arabias of this world are interested. So I, I think the new world order has gained momentum and, and the NATO war against Russia for Ukraine is not going to disturb that momentum. Now, um, Vice President Kamala Harris's Africa whirlwind trip um, I believe will end in Zambia, where there'll be a U.S.-led democracy summit that's, of that's... sorts. And 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 in fact, um, Fred Membe, who's the Zambia Socialist Party president, uh, says America are to lead a summit in Zambia to teach us democracy. They opposed our liberation. They supported um, colonial regimes, apartheid, Rhodesia, Angola, etc. They were part of the people who killed Lumumba, Gaddafi, and Nkuruma. They've got imperialist arrogance, thinking they can come to Zambia and teach us democracy. I, I, I'm very impressed by, by the president of, I think it's the Zambia Socialist Party, yes. one of the oppositions in, in Zambia. Very impressed, very, you know, clear ways and very straightforward. Mm. I still do not understand that there are people or countries in this world that listen to the United States of America talking about democracy. When inside the USA, they're not even democratic themselves. Their elections may look democratic, but we know it's money flowing. You look at how the Americans are ill-treating and oppressing black people inside the United States, and you think there's democracy. Mm -hmm. The USA, let's bring it back home, was one of the Western countries with the UK that, that housed, accommodated, supported, and funded the apartheid regime in South Africa. Mm. They've, they've done it all over. They've done it in Afghanistan. They've done it in Libya. And I mean, Libya is a mess that it is today because of the United States of America. And the very same people, they, they want to come and teach Africans about democracy. When they are undemocratic, they are imperialists. Mm. They, they use the military to do a regime change and put people in there. And I think that that a president of that party in Zambia is on the right track. Actually, if I was Harris, a vice president Harris of the U.S., I will cancel that leg of going to Zambia. The Zambian people must rise actually and disrupt that conference because it's not healthy for the African mind. Mm. It is not good that an imperialist, a destroyer of peace in every place comes and say, but we, we want to instill democracy. There was peace and economic progress in Libya. There was peace and economic economic progress in, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, everywhere else where the USA go, they mess up and they want to talk about democracy. Now, we, sh we should not worry about the US doing that because that's what they do. Mm. We should worry about African people and leaders who still want to listen to America telling them about democracy when they are actually imperialists and warmongers. Mm. And, and I think we should be very worried. We should not give them a platform to can or a forum to can have such such debates when actually America must go to their friend Israel and ask Israel stop occupying Palestine and Gaza and killing the children of Palestine. Why don't they do that? You know, there's not there's no democracy in there. there. There's apartheid in Palestine at the moment, instilled by by the Israelis who are armed, equipped, and funded by the USA. What does Israel have? That is making them so powerful in terms of minerals or anything else. Nothing. They, they have nothing mm. except what the other former colonizers in Africa steal from Africa and the Americans and funding states like Israel to oppress the people of Palestine. And I think the USA should be the last country to talk about democracy. But more and more countries are waking up. They are realizing that oh, this is what I call demon crazy because democracy as a whole, if you look at it, if we do not Africanize democracy, that's what we should do. Mm. We should make democracy to feed the African society. How would that look, though? So um, uh, decolonizing 
democracy, how that we, we should decolonize because it, look, it was brought into us and delivered to us in a form of uh, a statute that came from Rome, from the UK, and so forth. And and in Africa, for example, we've got we've got the monarchies. Mm. We should have democracy in such a way that it will respect our monarchy. I'm not saying this because I'm from the royal family, but nonetheless, we should we should look at the life situation of our people. We we are we are a developing economy. We are we are a poor country in 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 sense of the the cost of living per per person. You know, in South Africa, it's very low, and and we can't even afford that at the moment. Now, if we are going to come and bring democracy in a Western format, we are seeing now with the municipalities that it is not working for us. Mm. You understand where? I live in St. Chiron, but I can be a councillor at Olive and Old Bosch because Olive and Old Bosch is under 20. And, and that, that, that kind of democracy, the leaders of the society must be part of that society. Sure. The rules and regulations that governs that society or that nation must emanate from the historical background, from the cultural background of that particular country. I'm not I'm not a subscriber of this Western type of democracy, uh, but I think democracy is good on its own. But there's other good states that are not democratic. China is, is not a democratic state. When you look at it, they may be following democratic processes in electing members of the ruling Communist Party and so forth. But where has it ever really perfectly worked when it did not take into consideration the cultural principles of a country? The, the, the India is one of the leading democracies in the world. But you know why is it working? And there's a lot of coalitions in India. So it, actually, India is the biggest country on coalitions in the world, democratic coalition. It's, it's called the world leader on democracy. Because India has taken the cultural values of the people of India, they didn't destroy that. And that's what we should start looking at. Well, what do you say to people who say, unfortunately, a democracy that looks and smells and is shaped like that often doesn't care of human rights. Who, who determines the human rights? The human rights that the world is talking about today mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is human rights that are being orchestrated by the USA and the West. Mm -hmm. uh, but look at what they are doing in terms of human rights. Uh, do, do you want to sit here and I've used India as an example to say they are the largest democracy in the world. Mm -hmm. What human rights issues have we ever heard in India? And we should not confuse the things to say if we let people do democracy the way they see or they deem fit, therefore human rights were struck. Mm. Because it is the people who will determine what they want. Don't impose it on them. And if the people think, for example, in South Africa, President Ramaphosa is not doing what we want, the people will remove President Ramaphosa. And this has nothing to do with human rights. It has to do with respecting the wills of the people. The will of the majority. The will of the majority of the people, you understand? So... But in South Africa, it's even worse that even the minority are protected by the constitution of this country. This is one classical example of where if democracy is, is created in such a manner to suit the population, we had to go that route to accommodate the white minority or the minority groups in South Africa. If, if we didn't accommodate the minority groups, and I can tell them, for example, in gender, in gender you know, equalities, when you look at the LGTBIs, well protected in the constitution of South Africa, it didn't go into parliament to say we want gay rights like mm. in other countries. Mm. It, it, it went into parliament as a bill to say there's a minority group of people who prefer A, B, C, D, E. Can we respect their preference? And this is how it should be done, mm. where even the minorities' rights are protected. But again, in South Africa, it was done to also protect the white minorities who were afraid towards 1994 that what they inherited and, and, and benefited during the apartheid, uh, they will lose it towards the black majority. So that's why that accommodation mm. for the minority. So it can be done if leaders politically are willing to listen to what the, the people wish. Another example, if you look at the Northwest province, we've got the, the Royal Buffalo King family, mm. a, a royal family that is running the platinum you know, mines and all that. Look at how that family, under the democratic government, has maintained its royalty has maintained the well-being of Bafuki and, uh, and looks after its people. So it is possible to can do such things. We didn't go and destroy the monarchy uh, uh, in South Africa. We have the chiefs in KZN, we have the chief or the king in, 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 in Eastern Cape, in the Northwest and so forth, that are well accommodated to can take for the interest and the values of those communities under democratic state. Mm -hmm. So it is possible. Before we wrap up, in fact, let's wrap up with two battles. Before we do Mbeki versus Ramaphosa, 
Mpo Palace, a former uh, mayor of uh, Johannesburg versus John Stienhazen. Um, obviously, the DA are going into the elective conference. Does Mayor Palace even stand a chance? Does she even have a constituency within the DA? Why do you still refer to her as the mayor? Okay, uh, former mayor. Uh, uh, former mayor, Dr. Yes. Palace. Dr. Palace. Uh, look, uh, for people who believe in the battle of Goliath and, and David or the ant and the elephant, they will think it's possible. Politically, I don't think Dr. Palace stands any chance against a, 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 a white person like, like uh, Estienne Hazen. The Democratic Alliance... It's a it's a white dominated party, mm. and it's not only white dominated; it's male white dominated. Mbappe has stand no chance against SGN Hazen for the leadership of the of the of the of the Democratic Alliance. Again, we should also remember uh, Helen Zille has thrown her, herself into into that order, but not as the leader of the party. Sure. the chair of the Federal Council, which which is, I, which is, which is powerful, which I actually regard. Mm. Helen Zilli, as the true leader of the Democratic Alliance, that position, strategically, it's positioned there when she moved from being the leader of the party to be the federal chair or, or whatever. Uh, and she's more, much more powerful, and I think she will want to retain that to control the party. But I don't think Dr. Pallas has taken any chance by, 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 by any means, because the other thing is that the DA has lost a number of its black influential mm -hmm. uh, members leaders and voters and you know how voters people in south africa especially black people they go with a certain individual they prefer mm -hmm. and they say as a leader and the da has lost quite a number of black leaders in the last few years and i don't think uh, uh white people knowing how white people think in south africa they will put their vote next to mpopalazzi when john says hazen is city I, I don't see that happening i think Stan hazen is going to come that as the leader of the da and 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 and, and, and helen zil is going to come out as the federal chair and I don't, I don't expect any changes there. Mbeki versus Ramaphosa. What is that even about? Well, people are saying it's about Palapala, pala, but I think, you know, this Palapala, pala, what do you call it? The Palapala pala that doesn't want to disappear. Yes. I, I think President Mbeki, uh, either he is tired that the wheels of discipline inside the ANC mm. are not bearing the fruits. You have touched small little individuals. I think that's one of the things I'm thinking. Number two, I've heard a lot of ANC members, even on social media, some in some political discussions, saying President Beggy has had his time, he must shut up and sit at the back. And that's where the problem is. Do you want President Beggy to shut up and take a back seat mm. when it suits you? But when you want President Beggy to campaign for the ANC, to also get involved when there are squabbles. You have heard ANC members say, let us call our elders, uh, President Mbeki, President Mokranti, to come and handle these mm. squabbles. You call them in. I, I, I don't think it's a battle between Mbeki and Ramaphosa. I think President Mbeki is trying to say, and I've read his, his letter to, to the deputy president, mm. and he's doing the right thing. So what did he say in the letter? Uh, uh, he is simply saying to the deputy president, because he asked the deputy president because he's complaining about the behavior and the conduct of the president. So correctly, so he addresses sure. the letter to the deputy president, uh, Mr. Mashatile, to say, I've raised this issue with an open letter before with President Ramaphosa. This Palapala story and many other things that are happening, it looks like it's being shelved and, and put aside. The Section 9 or, you know, Chapter 9 institutions mm. uh, 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 are just, you know, lame dark uh, reports. But the issue of the, the committee of three judges that was elected, to can look at this, he's complaining that it's being ignored and it's not being taken serious. He's raising the fact that he's worried about the ANC vote against that report in 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 in, in Parliament. Mm -hmm. And he's saying actually to Mr. Mashadile, what is the party position regarding this issue? Why does it look like the party, which is the African National Congress, is shielding mm -hmm. uh, President Ramaphosa for doing the wrong thing? And, and members of the ANC are complaining, say, yeah, but why are you asking? Let's deal with this thing internally. I think he is dealing with it internally by writing to the deputy president of the party. But but again, the danger part of it is President Mbeki may be saying to the ANC, this is going to damage the party come mm -hmm. the elections. Be very careful of how you are handling this. If I, I was going to say, I mean, if you've written a letter to mm -hmm. the deputy president, why are you still waxing lyrical about it? in public platforms. Why, why, what? Why are you still talking about it in, in public then? What, 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 again, Fresh, what is wrong in talking about in public platforms? We have structures. The, the structures. 
what the deputy president of the ANC should have done. He should have taken that letter to committees and they take it to structures and let the structures decide. Mm -hmm. But President Beck is worried that this will take long mm -hmm. for it to, to, to arrive at the bottom. This thing is in the eyes of the public and the international community. Can we address the niche? Well, the ANC has been very quiet about the Palapala issue. Mm -hmm. Every time they try and talk about it, they will say, we are waiting for the public protector's office. We are waiting for the NPA, the Reserve Bank and SARS and so forth. They are shifting the blame to the government. They are not dealing with their member. President Ramaphosa is the member of the ANC, is the president of the ANC, and the party must have a position. If they have done it with the Secretary General, who was placed on, on, on what do they call it, step aside, I know President Ramaphosa is not being charged, so the step aside rule is not applicable because there's no official charge mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. towards him. But again, we know there are political parties and people who have gone to police station to lay charges against Mr. Ramaphosa. Just because it's not done by the government or it's not done by the ANC, they say it's not charged. And I think that frustrates President Baker. But if I was a member of the African National Congress, I would sit here and listen to the wisdom of President Mbeki, what is he trying to tell him? He's trying to say to them, and I've said it earlier, he's trying to say to the ANC, guys, this will damage us come 2024 elections. Mm -hmm. Can we deal with this matter at the moment? He's not actually even dictating to them on how they should deal with sure. it. He's simply saying we can't put this thing under the carpet. Sure. It is very dangerous. Let's, let's manage, manage perceptions. Let's manage perception. And the ANC is failing. Mm -hmm. it's, very, it's failing this money. To, to manage perception. You know, there's one important element I thought about when I read that letter on the Palapala dollars. The reports that came out said not all the money was too late. Then you must ask yourself, where's the remainder of the money from Palapala? But that's a discussion we'll have at some other stage to say, what happened to the remainder of the dollars that were not stolen at that Palapala uh, farm? Mm. Uh, and, and these are some of the issues that the ANC of President Mahama Posa must have put the nation you know, into confidence of what is happening there. Just to say the public, and, 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 and look, fresh, I'm not going to beat up the push to saying sitting heads of states in South Africa has a history of abusing Chapter 9 institutions mm -hmm. and state. All of them, they've done it. All of them, when it suited them, they've done it. They can deny it. You say, I don't interfere. I listened to Bulelani Nuka yesterday on one of the media platform interviews, explaining himself after so many years, how did he let Jacob Zuma, you know, to go through his fingers. And I was saying to myself, why did he mistake Nuka or advocate Nuka come at that time when we needed this information? 2017 years down the line, he comes and he explains. So there is an abuse of state institutions by the sitting presidents or leaders of the ANC. That is a fact. We have seen it in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. You can even see the judgment, the decisions. I mean, if you look at legal uh, parameters, three sitting judges say there's something, and an advocate who's a public protector says something different, and the predecessor has said something different. So you can see there's interference. There is no consistency in legal decision making in South Africa when it comes to political office bearers. We don't have mm. consistency. Mm. You know, uh, uh, the, the, the rule of law differs when it's fresh. If it was me or you, sure. who would have done this? Would have been a different practice. I, mm. Imagine if the Palapala dollars were found in Ganga. Yes. Because it's talking a completely different story. Mm. And this actually makes the nation to question the integrity of Chapter 9 institutions and public uh, you know, law enforcement institutions. And that's where the challenge, and I think that's where President Becky is getting frustrated. And on that note, that is all we wrote. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks to the to the to the viewers and the followers and listeners. Please, they must continue the subscription button to click it, and 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 I think we'll we'll meet again over breakfast next week. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, our political Botsang Muilo is about to leave the building. Shout out to every single wowzer that tunes in, that subscribes, and that's a part of this madness. Shout out to Amp Studio. Thank you for hosting us in your beautiful facility. We love it. Africa Podcast Network. Love you guys. Pezulu Works. Your cinematography is second to none. Our audio engineer, magician, artist, the flow, Fraser. Uh, shout out, dog. And to our guest, our political, Butsang Muilwa. And finally, our creative director, Kuvesh Mohan, and our show producer, Kelezo Mudisa King. Until next week, have a great political week, in spite of yourselves. This is... Wow! What a week. What a week.